All right, I show the time is 1200. That means we must be here at the presentation by number 75, Kara Moon. But before he begins his presentation, I want to make a couple announcements. First of all, uh, Kevin Mitnick's presentation tonight at 1700 hours has been switched with the off the hook uncensored version. So that will be going on tonight, off the hook uncensored. Is it 8 o'clock? Yeah, 2000. Right, watch out there, number uh, 316. All right, so thank you. That will be switched with off the hook. Mitnick will be tomorrow at the same time, so those two have just reversed. If you want to correct that in your guide, we'll keep announcing it anyway, but please enjoy. Uh, I also have a note that at 1700, that's what's going on. The presentation at 1700 has been canceled, and it's going to be biometrics in science fiction here in this room at 1700. So if you're interested in that, I hope to see you back then. Uh, for now, we have number 75, Kara Moon, talking about the life and times of Alan Turing. OK. Cool. <laughs> um, just a quick show of hands. Like, How many people could confidently give a talk on Turing's life? I'm just curious, like the level of knowledge. OK, a few. That's good. Um, it's, not, it's nice that actually people have at least some interest in him. Um, I just thought it was really important that this talk was given. I think it's really important people, you know, know who Turing was and why he's important to us. Um, and it's kind of funny that we really need to explain this to people because, as we're going to see through my talk, he's a really fundamental um, character in the history of computing and lots of other subjects as well. Um, I'm Kara Moon. I'm involved in a whole bunch of things, um, but I mainly hang out on the Super Dimension Fortress, which is one of the oldest public access Unix systems going. I think they've been going since 1984. I can see a few SDFers in the uh, audience, which is really good. Um, please, please join. It's free. You just tell net to sdf.lonestar.org. Um, a really big, exciting project we've got up going at the moment is called The Non, which is essentially a, a parallel non-commercial internet. Um, a big project and, you know, worth looking into. Um, why, why did I bother talking about Turing, really? Why, why am I going to take an hour of your time to talk about this uh, English dude? Um, first of all, like I said before, not a huge number of people are familiar with him. Even people that are um, you know, quite involved in the computing scene and hacking scene still seem in the dark about what Turing did and why he's so important to us. Um, a lot of people describe him as being the father of the modern computer, and uh, I'll go through why he's described in that way and, uh, and why I think it's a valid description. Um, a really big thing is that, depending on who you believe, some of us would be uh, not here <laughs> if it wasn't for him. Um, Turing was one of the key figures in breaking the German Enigma code, which I'll be talking about in, in relative detail. Um, some military historians think it probably shortened the war by three years, um, you know, which, is, which is a lot of lives. So. Yep. You know, possibly we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him. Um, and the human rights issue is, is interesting as well. Uh, Turing was a victim of persecution. Um, and it's, it's quite a tragic tale that I'm going to be telling today. So, uh, so it's a good example to give people of uh, why we need to fight for human rights now and uh, not wait until it's too late. Um, sources on Turing are kind of actually hard to come by. Um, there's a few reasons for this. In, in England, he sort of, I think there's, there is still some embarrassment um, surrounding him. Um, there's embarrassment that uh, he, he died in the way that he did, which I should be explaining later. Um, we have lots of security issues in England, um, i.e. the people that make security laws are just crazy, really. We have things like the 40-year rule, which says that big secrets should stay secret for 40 years. Um, so a lot of the papers and, and information on Turing is, is only just coming available. We also don't have fair use. Um, I know in, in the US fair use is, is, is you know quite quite a big issue, but in, in the UK we just we don't have it. There's no like um, copyright exemption for educational stuff generally. Um, I mean something as simple as photocopying a map, you're allowed like 10% of a map. That's it. It's quite serious. So. The main sources on Turing are a bunch of books that people have written by him. Um, just, again, a quick show of hands. Who's read all four of those books? Anyone? OK, cool. Um, and I guess I'd say that the, the, the book that most of you may have read is um, Godel Eshabak, 
How many people have read that? OK, cool. Um, that's the main book that introduces people to Turing. Um, as the title suggests, it's about Kurt Gödel, who is a um, Czech mathematician, I believe, um, M. C. Escher and Johann Sebastian Bach. Um, throughout the book, the Turing machine, which was Turing's theoretical computer, is used as an example of how computing and artificial intelligence works. The code book is, is, a, is an excellent book by a British journalist um, all about history of code breaking. Turing the Enigma is, is the main source of information on Turing by a guy called um, Hodges. He did a massive, massive research project over many, many, many years, continually revising his uh, um, book. It's, it is fantastic. It's quite biased. I'll kind of explain about that later as well. He's a very bitter man, Hodges, <laughs> as some of you may know. I hope he's not here. <laughs> um, if, if you want to go to a bookstore, you could uh, find those books. Um, yeah, the, the, the Hodges one is, is really worth reading. Massive. It's like 500 pages. The, the print is like a quarter of the size of an old book. So um, it's good for ice strain. OK, so Alan Turing was born in uh, 1912 um, in the UK. His parents were quite insistent that he was born in the UK, um, although he was uh, conceived in India. His um, dad was uh, involved in the military in the Foreign Office. Um, and the East, England, East India Shipping Company booth. Turing went to school in a public school, which is a private school <laughs> with a strange nomenclature in England. Um, and he, he exhibited what a lot of us would probably call hacker traits, um, you know, kind of a, a loner, a bit, um, a bit of a, an interesting guy. He was quite uh, sort of oblivious to how the systems around him worked and, and the system in which he was living. Um, and, and that's a theme that runs throughout his life, um, sort of a cross between being oblivious and not giving a damn, um, which is probably quite a cool way to live, really, um, except it may have cost him his life in the end. We'll uh, talk about that later. <laughs> Die for freedom, yeah, it's worth it. Um, so Turing, Turing was at, at, this, at this private school. He was um, really good in science, pretty poor in the other subjects. Um, he, he went on to excel in science, and the school really wasn't satisfied. The school was trying to turn out well-rounded English gentlemen. Um, the sort of, you know, this, this was British Empire time. Um, the, the, you know, these are the people that were going to go and, uh, and and make the planet ours. <laughs> um, it's quite a scary thought, really, in, in these times with the uh, current U.S. administration and, and my good friend Tony Blair. So Turing got out of school and got into King's College, Cambridge. Um, he was not massively happy about that. He was aiming for Trinity College. The reason he was aiming at Trinity College was at school he fell in love with uh, a guy called Morecambe. Um, and homosexuality is, is kind of quite a big theme in his life. Um, and again, was, was probably the main thing that cost him his life in the end. Um, and he had this sort of... Uh, oblivious and not giving a damn kind of attitude to it, which was quite cool. Um, hard, hard, hard as it may be to believe, King's College was quite, King's College in the 30s was like quite an, an anarchistic haven, really. Um, Hodges describes it as being amoral in the tr truest sense, that the people there were really, um, had the mindset that every case, every issue, they would judge on its merits. They didn't feel constrained by external laws. Um, in, in 1933, the, the Union of King's College pa passed a motion saying that they would n never go to war for king or country, um, which is, is quite a serious thing to say um, in, in England, in, a, you know, in, in our um, fascist totalitarian country. You know, they, they were saying that, yeah, they could possibly go and, and, and kill some people in the name of security, but uh, it, you know, it, was, it was no longer good enough to go out and, uh, and die for your beloved country. I think, I think Turing was quite happy at King's. Um, it was quite an amazing atmosphere there. Um, basically, he was doing research. He was doing a bit of teaching, um, just, just generally having a cool time. And, and in, in particular, in King's, uh, because it was sort of an anarchistic community, um, Homosexuality just wasn't an issue. People would sort of turn a blind eye, unlike the rest of society. It was, it was kind of quite a cool place to hang out. Um, 
Turing was really a mathematician. Um, we can't really say he was a computer scientist because he invented computer science, um, so we can't really say that yet. Um, he was interested in some really, really deep maths um, that has massive implications for how computing and how programming work. Um, he was interested in things like Godel's incompleteness theorem. Um, that's a really important result in mathematics that says that systems can either be complete or powerful, but not both. Um, Kurt Godel was a, was a brilliant mathematician, really fucked things up for mathematicians um, by, by uh, proving that it, in some senses at least it's all a waste of time. Um, the, the, the way he did it was really interesting. He, he looked at proof, the idea of proof, and looked at proofs for things, and he um, realized that a, a bit like um, maybe like an object-oriented program where we, we look at the study of nouns, he thought like proofs could be treated as, as, as nouns and in particular as numbers. So he, he thought he could number the proofs and then find some properties of those numbers that were consistent with them, them being valid proofs. And then he could create some numbers that fitted within the system but weren't for valid proofs. Um, so he was really interested in like, the study of paradox and stuff. Um, I'm sure most of you have, have read things like Principia Mathematica, so I won't go into a lot of detail in that. Um, but G Godel's stuff is really interesting, really worth looking into. Um, kind of really touches on, uh, goes, goes into the nature of, of truth. Um, the nature of infinity was something that really interested um, Turing, and it's something that, that is, is actually really important in um, looking at um, computer programming and whether programs will terminate in particular. Um, Infinity turns out to be quite different from what you expect. Um, in, the, um, in the popular mathematical press, for example, we generally think of infinity as being a, an infinitely huge number. Um, it turns out there are a wide variety of types of infinity. Um, I mean, a, a simple example is if you take the number one and the number two and you look at all the <coughs> fractions in between, you find that there's an infinite number of fractions in between. Yeah, you could just keep dividing into smaller and smaller and smaller slices. So between the numbers one and two, you have an, a sort of infinitely dense number line. Um, but then we can find other numbers that um, fit between one and two, but aren't fractions, like the square root of two, which is a, an infinite decimal. Um, so that's sandwiched in between one and two, and yet we've said one and two are infinitely dense. So you've got like an infinitely dense chunk of the number line with some holes in. Um, so infinity is not um, what it seems, really. And it's quite important in, uh, in computability, which was really a, a concept that Turing came up with. Um, there are a whole bunch of like challenges in mathematics um, proposed by a guy called Hill, but um, he, did, he did something kind of quite cool and also really lazy. Um, when he was coming up for retirement, um, instead of like not retiring and, uh, and, and doing something worthwhile, he thought he'd just write a whole bunch of challenges and like just say to the world, do all this stuff. To, um, to progress in mathematics. So we wrote like, this big list of problems and said, any one of these problems that, that we managed to solve um, pushes back the boundaries of mathematics. Um, Godel um, sol solved two, two of those problems by um, saying that, uh, that maths doesn't really work as, as a concept. Um, and uh, Turing went on to, to solve the halting problem. The halting problem is quite interesting, really. When you I'm sure you've written computer programs that um, go into loops, and uh, you think, that's really annoying. I'll go, I'll go and read some books and try and work out um, what happened. Um, in general, if you wanted to see if a computer program is going to go into, a, into an infinite loop, um, you might think, well, we'll write another computer program and like read through the code, like pass through the code. Um, and Turing w w was, was thinking about this idea, obviously not with computer programs. When, when Turing talks about computers um, in, his, in his papers. There obviously were no computers. There was no concept of a computer. So a computer meant someone who sat down at a table with a bunch of paper and a pen, crunching, you know, doing number crunching it, basically. Turing was very interested in the idea of um, methods, formal methods for doing things, like the essentially what we now call algorithms. He basically came up with the concept of, of the algorithm. Um, so we've got an algorithm. We want to see, does it work? Is it going to just get into a continuous loop? So we might have another algorithm, um, possibly in our head, um, i.e. We, we would read through the code, and we'd go through the code step by step, and we'd think, what's happening in this code? Is it going to loop? Um, we might replace ourselves with a computer program. We might have a computer program that goes through parsing through code, seeing if it's going to loop. However, 
um, very quickly, you, you should see a problem, which is that we're writing a program to pass the program, but how do we know our program's not gonna loop? So you get these, these layers and layers and layers and layers of programs, um, and this is a really key, key thing that Turing worked out. Um, that just formal methods are probably limited in their power. Um, one, one thing Turing was really interested in was like the concept of the soul. He was, he was ob brought up as a Christian like mo most people were, and yet became um, quite a, a strong atheist in the end. It's quite interesting to look through his life, the sort of things that made him change his mind. Um, and he's, I, I think he and, and a lot of other people in, in, the, in the breaking points of mathematics and in the breaking, particularly in the breaking points of physics, people saw God, you know, um, I'm sure most of you have, have, have seen people or read about um, quantum theory and people using this as like a justification for saying humans have free will and all that nonsense, um, which we don't, obviously. Any, anyone, with, anyone, anyone with a basic knowledge of physics knows that. Um, think things like quantum spontaneity and, and you know, quantum electrodynamics and stuff was, was seen as a real opportunity um, to kind of... Um, to kind of win, win back our lives from science, to say, you know, hold on, there are these random things in science, this, this quantum spontaneity of things just happening, the, these probability fields, stuff like this. Um, another thing Turing was just randomly interested in was density of primes, because um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really nice, um, difficult problem in maths, and the sort of thing that you think should be quite solvable with a, a formal method. So the density of primes is quite simple that as the numbers get bigger and bigger and bigger, the primes get fewer and fewer and fewer, which intuitively sort of makes sense because with a big number, um, there are far more numbers below it that can be multiplied together to get that number. Um, so sort of on an intuitive level, it, it seems to make sense. Um, and Turing was really interested in the idea of, of making a formal method um, that could pr um, pr prove that primes do get le um, much less dense as we go along the number line. So he, use, he uses that as, as a sort of a problem throughout most of his life, really. Um, and as he comes up with the concept of the computer, it's something that he really wants to tackle, and he, he, he does in a hardware way. One of the, the reasons that at least some people have heard of the Turing is, is the Turing machine, which was his idealized kind of concept of, of a computer. The Turing machine is really, really in interesting. It looks really, really simple, but it's, it's quite a deep concept. Um, Turing thought about how, how we solve problems, in particular, how do we do mathematics. And he thought, thought about someone sitting at a table with loads of paper and some pens, and how would, they, how would they do number crunching? How would they solve problems? How would they do proofs? And he tried to, to think of what he could cut away from that picture. To, to get the real essence of how, how we do mathematics or how we solve any problems. And he came up with the Turing machine. And the idea of the Turing machine is that you have an infinitely long tape with squares and you have a, a head that can read the squares. So some of the squares may have characters on, the head can erase the characters, the head can write more characters. Um, the machine has a, has a whole bunch of states. And depending on what state it's in, depends what it will do. To, to the next character it comes across, or the next square it comes across. An interesting thing about the Turing machine um, is that it's quite easy to extend the idea into a machine with like lots of lots of tapes and lots of tape heads, or um, two-dimensional tapes instead of this one-dimensional tape, or um, machines that have uh, at each at each point can branch off and and, and make various decisions. The, the, the really nice thing about the Turing machine is that you, know, you see this multi-headed Turing machine, actually any Turing machine, um, no matter how complicated, you can always condense it down to the idea of a, a single head with a, a long tape. Okay? Um, Turing thought about this machine, and he thought about writing a description of the machine, what the machine does, how it does it. So he came up with the idea of a, sort of a Turing table, so you know, a Turing machine, you might have a Turing machine, for example, that, that adds numbers together. It goes along the tape, reads a number, reads the next number, adds them up, writes the third number, yeah, writes the answer. Um, so he, he, he's got the idea of these tables, tables describing the machines. And he thought, 
I could get one of these tables and feed it into another Turing machine and get the Turing machine to, to sort of mimic um, the first Turing machine. So we get like an addition Turing machine, write down its description, get a multiplication Turing machine, write down its description, get um, a Microsoft Word Turing machine, write down its description. <coughs> and we'd feed these descriptions into to what became known as the universal Turing machine that could mimic any other Turing machine. So these descriptions are essentially computer programs. You came up really with, with the, the, the true concept of computer program and, and the, the universal computer, which, which is, is quite different from things like Babbage's calculating machine um, and uh, um, Lovelace's kind of programs and things like the, the, the looms. You know, the early computers were, were, were based on looms for weaving and you'd, you'd feed it in a pattern about weaving. Um, <clears throat> but it could really only do a set of fixed steps and could only f follow whatever was in the pattern. Um, whereas Turing really came up with this idea of computer programs that could be fed into universal Turing machines. Um, and and one, one kind of interesting side issue is that sort of intrinsic in the idea of the Turing machine is the idea that a Turing machine can modify its own code. <coughs> because the, the, the code it follows is on this tape, and it can erase the characters, and it can write characters. So in, sort of in, intrinsically in, in the concept is quite a powerful compute, computer programming concept, the idea that it, you know, it can go through and change its own code. Um, so despite the fact that the Turing machine might seem kind of quite an abstract um, concept, it is, it is sufficiently powerful to be a decent description of a, of a computer. Um, some of you may have also heard of the Turing test, um, pop popularized by um, the Vo Voigtkampf test in uh, Blade Runner. So you've all seen Blade Runner, yeah? OK, that's everyone, just nodded. <laughs> um, Voigtkampf test is a, is a test to see if someone's an android or not. Um, it's quite a problem in society today with all these androids walking around. <laughs> Um, you, you shouldn't laugh because there could be an, an Android sitting next to you. Um, if you had a Voigtkampf machine, then you could tell. The Voigtkampf machine just looks at the, the um, physical responses um, in the body and uh, uses that to determine um, whether the per person is, is human or is an Android. Turing, um, who lived a little bit before Blade Runner was made, um, he, he invented the, the idea of the Turing test and he rejected um, looking at the physical attributes because he, he didn't think that was a, really an important aspect um, of intelligence. Now, Voigtkampf is just a test is some, something human. Turing, Turing's test is either um, wider or, or, or more restrictive, depending on your philosophy. Turing's test was, was to test if something is intelligent. And Turing's test is very nice because it kind of allows us to not muck around with defining what intelligence is. Very, very simple idea based on um, something called the imitation game. <coughs> In the imitation game, you have a man and a woman, um, and they're hidden from you behind screens or whatever, and you can pass them the questions, and you can get the responses, and you have to work out who's the man, who's the woman. And, uh, it's, it's really not a good, this, this is like the example Turing based his, his test on, it's really not a good example. So the Turing test, we replace one of the people with a computer and we try and find out which one is a computer program and which one's a human. Um, the man and woman concept doesn't really work very well because Turing essentially says that if, if it's sufficiently difficult that we can't tell which, which one is the computer program, which one is the person, then, then the computer program can be said to be intelligent. Um, this is why the, the man and woman thing doesn't really work, because most of you would say that if you couldn't guess whether someone's a man or woman, it doesn't mean that, that they're the same thing. Um, so maybe, maybe Turing was a little bit misguided with his, his example in, in his, um, his, his papers on the Turing test. The Turing test is really, really relevant today, and it's really relevant to, to people in, interested in security. So it's quite um, important to test if people are human or not. Um, many of you have used Capture. Many of you have used Capture. Who's used Capture today? OK, yeah. So quite a few of you know what it is. Completely automated public Turing test to tell computers and humans apart. 
capture are those um, annoying little boxes you get when you um, post messages to email lists maybe um, through a web interface or you sign up for, for um, anything on the web, you get a little box with some jumbled up letters and you've got to type in the letters. Um, this is essentially a Turing test because the, the computer program is trying to test whether you're human or not. Um, and uh, it's, it's kind of ironic and, 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 and pretty sad that these are widespread throughout the net and that they're really testing whether you're human or not because certain people um, fail those tests all the time. Visually impaired people, for example, um, they're human. In, in my opinion, um, but obviously not include, um, according to people who, who invented capture. Uh, so f from a security point of view, it's quite interesting to, to be able to tell if an entity is, is um, a human or if it's a computer, and maybe intelligence is, 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 is quite a good way to test this. Some of you may have been at the uh, CCC last year. There was, um, uh, not, uh, what the heck last year, there was a talk on biometrics and, and fingerprint scanners. Um, and basically, fingerprint scanners are what sort of security engineers term um, a bunch of crap. They, uh, fingerprint scanners generally run at like 600 DPI, and you know any fool can like make a latex finger to beat a fingerprint scanner. So there's lots of life sensors, um, and you know to, to see to check that it's really a live finger and that you haven't like hacked your friend's finger off um, or anything like that. So. Testing whether people are alive or not is quite interesting, and maybe testing if they're intelligent is a nice way to do that. This is, a, this is a, I think, quite a cute capture. Um, it's quite difficult uh, um, to do uh, visual recognition with um, photos of things. Capture, capture as a concept is, is not very strong um, with this, the, the letter ones that we have. Very, very easy to, to you know, write a few lines of Perl to, to be capture stuff. Um, just by, by um, doing like optical character recognition, just like your scanner would. This capture, however, is, is quite cool. So you have a, photos of a bunch of animals, and you have to click on the, uh, the animals that it asks for. So it might say, you might have like kittens and puppies, and you have to click on the kittens. Um, and that's relatively difficult for computer programs to do. Um, this is... My, this is a, this really, really does tie into Turing and like, the concept of intelligence because um, anyone who knows about artificial intelligence will know that there are a whole bunch of problems that look easy or, or, or look kind of doable and really aren't. Um, visual recognition is one of them. Speech recognition is, is, is also one of them. Um, speech recognition is really, really difficult to, to do well. It's really, really, really difficult. And we're not really sure why humans can do it so well. Um, and, and again, with visual recognition, we're not not really sure why um, it's, you know, we can instantly tell the difference between a, a fox and a panda, but computer programs really struggle because they both have like eyes and noses and other cool things that animals have. <coughs> so Turing was, was at, at Cambridge, um, King's College, doing maths research, and then uh, World War II broke out. and. Uh, Prior to World War II, he had spent a bit of time at a place called Bletchley Park. He had been visiting there for workshops and stuff. Um, Bletchley Park is, uh, was, the gov uh, was the government code and cipher school, which is a bit like the NSA in the US. Um, Bletchley Park, the, the government code and cipher school, became GCHQ, um, which is the government communications headquarters, which is yeah, our, our equivalent of the NSA. So. You're all familiar with like NSA and GCHQ and stuff, yeah. Um, like in, in the US, you have um, FBI that allegedly does security, CIA that kills people in other countries, and NSA that like um, feeds them both information and kind of argues about whose information it is. In England, we have GCHQ. Um, GCHQ is like quite good at being secretive. Um, some of you may have heard of like things like public key encryption. Um, Public encryption was invented at GCHQ um, <coughs> way before like Diffie-Hellman key exchange and all that kind of stuff. Um, or, well, at least a few years before, and kept quiet. Um, it was only a, a few years ago that it sort of became public. GCHQ is very, very secretive, and in, in England, secrecy is it really is a, a key thing with uh, certain government bodies, military and security ones. Um, so a lot of the old government code government code and cipher school stuff 
relating to Turing still is, is quite, uh, kept quiet. Bletchley Park, quite a nice place to hang out. A um, whole bunch of, of people that we would really recognize as hackers, you know, typical hacker traits, the way that they, they solve problems related to security, just a big group of people in, in, a, in a room passing the problem around to, to everyone, having discussions, trying to, not having like set ways to approach stuff. So if, if, you, if you look into like history of Bletchley Park and, and, and what went on there, you really see that in, in World War II it's what we would consider hackers. Um, <coughs> controlled by the military, but there was this sort of unwritten rule that um, the, the civilian staff, people like Alan Turing and, and, and the other code breakers, were given a, f a free reign, really. They, they didn't wear uniform, they didn't respect rank. Um, they were all equal. They were just a, a random mixture of people. This was where Turing spent um, much of uh, World War II, in um, one of the, uh, the, the sort of huts in this lovely uh, the grounds of this big stately home. Turing spent his days there work, working on security problems, working on, on in particular how to break codes, but also, also how to, to make some, make some uh, security algorithms as well, which I'll talk about a bit later on. The really key thing um, that Bletchley Park did was break the German Enigma code. Um, there's quite a lot of controversy around the Enigma. Um, it's not well founded, really. The, the, the controversy is about whether the, um, the, the Polish actually broke all the Enigma first. The Enigma machine was a, an electromechanical enciphering system. So you put in your message, it does some number crunching, um, electricity flows around, things move, it makes a sound, lights light up, and uh, you, you have, have security. The Enigma was needed because sort of in, in, in World War I, codes were rubbish. I mean, it was just people writing stuff on bits of paper and, and like jumbling up letters and stuff. It was really, really poor. In the 30s, the idea of um, the one-time one pad encryption um, came up. With, everyone knows what one-time pad encryption is. And that's all of you again. Excellent. <laughs> um, one-time one pad encryption. Um, is um, theoretically, it's a mathematically 100% secure. You have something you want to encode, and you have <coughs> essentially a password the, the same length as what you want to encode, and you mix them together. The password is completely randomly generated. And that encodes it. You have to have the password to get it out, um, and then you throw, throw away the password. So you use it once, hence the term one-time pad. Um, has any, anyone here broken systems using one-time pad encryption? Probably some of you have. Um, One-time pad, pad encryption is, is mathematically impossible to break, and yet it's not massively difficult to break encryption systems using one-time pads. Um, why is that? Well, if, if it's mathematically impossible to break one-time pad encryption, then to, to, to break a system using one-time pads can, can only mean that it's not using them properly. So one-time one pads are sometimes used for like network security protocols, um, and they're generally not very good because they reuse the pads, so it's not one time, and the random al algorithms they use to generate um, don't really uh, are not very random. You know, the, the seeding isn't very good on them, so it's you know it's, it's not massively difficult to break um, certain n network and encryption systems using one-time pads. And a British hacker. Um, John Wignall um, has, has been doing some work on this in the UK, um, looking at things like when the, when the, uh, the messages um, are, are too short or too long and you get like padding, you like pad out the messages with zeros and, and then you've got like known cipher text, which is the uh, real enemy of encryption. So the enigma was needed, really, as it, it, was, it was really important to have a, a practical system of encryption. So the enigma was way stronger than a, you know, someone with a bit of paper and a, and a pen writing a, writing a load of nonsense and uh, jumbling it up. Um, but obviously not strong, strong, like one-time pad encryption. But it, 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 was, it was massively popular. It was a, com a commercial system sold throughout Germany in, in, the, in the 30s. The German military weren't interested in it in the beginning. Um, <coughs> people became really interested in, in encryption 
just before World War II, when it was like discovered how um, easily the uh, the codes had been broken from World War One. Um, in, in, in World War One, radio was really popular, and with radio, you really do need to be thinking about security a lot. The key to how the Enigma works is like these these rotors um, that are in at the sort of center of the machine. <coughs> so with Enigma, you've got a box, you've got a keyboard, and you've got some um, lights with with letters beside them, and Essentially, you want to be able to press a key and light up pretty much a random light. Yeah, um, in encryption is really the process of, of taking information and making it look random, kind of removing all, all the patterns from it. Um, the way the Enigma did this was that when you pressed a button on the keyboard, it, um, the, the electrical circuit went through a bunch of rotors. Um, maybe we've got a better picture. You press, for example, A, and the electrical circuit was, was formed th through these rotors, and G would light up. Um, it wouldn't really work if it was just a bunch of wires um, or, or just something on a printed circuit board. But because they were rotors, as you're pressing keys, the rotors are going around, um, so the circuits are changing. So if you press A again later on in the message, you, you wouldn't get necessarily get a G, you might get a C, for example. Um, so you can imagine typing away and all these lights lighting up, and uh, it looks pretty random. Um, because the electrical circuit went through the rotors one way and then came back through the rotors another way with this reflector, it meant that the, the encryption was sort of um, symmetric in the, in the um, way that if someone else had the Enigma machine and it was set up the same way as yours, um, they could type in the code and get out the plain text, um, which was which was quite nice. So you didn't you didn't need to have like an, an encryption and decryption mode. The Enigma is, is is really quite interesting. It's really really worth um, looking into how it works. When you when you set up the Enigma, you've got this 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 box and it's got a whole lot of settings, a whole lot of things you can change, and you change them and that essentially makes a configuration just like a, a Turing machines configuration. <coughs> and in particular, we've got five things you can change. So you've got these rotors, um, and the in a main military Enigma machine had three rotors, and you've got a choice of five that you can put in. Um, so that's quite a few combinations. I said that the rotors go round um, while you're typing your message. Now, the first rotor goes around quite quickly, and then every kind of once or twice it goes around, the next rotor will move, and then when that goes around, around once or twice, the next rotor will move. Um, there was a, like a ring inside the rotor that dictated at what point it would go around. Um, there were like these kind of notched rings. We've got three rotors. We can, we can put them in different orders, so that's like another six combinations. We've got a plug board on, on the front of the Enigma. If we jump back to the picture, you can kind of see it. The <coughs> right in the front of the picture, below the keyboard, um, you can see a whole bunch of, of pairs of sockets. And we've got some like patch leads, essentially, so we can cross over some letters. Um, that, makes, that makes the Enigma really difficult to break. Um, adding the plug board was made a much, much bigger um, Increase the, the, the sort of um, number of configurations far more than adding more rotors would. Um, so that's quite an interesting thing. Then the final thing you do is set the starting positions for those rotors. So those rotors um, are, are sort of have got the alphabet around the edge, and you can set the starting position. So generally, steps one to four would probably be like the, the what, what we'd maybe call a day key. Um, Essentially, that the configuration of the Enigma is the password. All you need is an Enigma machine in the same configuration to decode the stuff. So the configuration acts as a password um, with billions of combinations. Um, so the, fir the first four would be like the day code. And then for each message, you'd set the, um, the, the configuration of the, the, the um, initial position of these three rotors. So, Day code would be like in a code book, so you've still got this issue of distributing code books around, you know, around where you're killing people. Um, and then for each message, you'd start off by, by send, sending um, the, the a, a sort of three-letter group 
it would say where the position of the three rotors would be. Um, it was seriously difficult to break, and that's going back to the Polish thing. <coughs> the Polish broke um, the Enigma before World War II started, um, which is quite a sensible thing to do, really, and, and it's a lesson we can all learn. <laughs> um, you know, break, break technology before it's used against you. Um, the, the, the Polish, you know, felt this presence, that they felt this, this kind of a shadow of Germany. They thought bad stuff might happen. Um, and instead of watching TV like we do now, they thought it might be sensible to, uh, you know, make, make hay while the sun shines or whatever. However, the reason I don't buy into, like, this big controversy of... Uh, there are quite a few angry, angry Polish people, angry that people like Turing get the credit for breaking the enigma when the Polish broke it years before and repeatedly tried to give the British enigma machines and code books and plans of how to break it, and the British said, you know, we're not massively interested. Um, th th those are like fair issues, but the Enigma wasn't just one machine. There were whole, whole variations of them. The one the Polish broke was quite simple. Um, the Polish did, did do something really, really powerful, though, which is that they invented, um, they invented cryptography. They invented the idea of, of the modern idea of how we break codes. In particular, what the, the, the Polish did was they had mathematicians breaking codes. So prior to that, um, you just get, get a bunch of your mates around your house, really, and, <laughs> and, and, and break some code. You just get random people. Um, in particular, you get linguists. Everyone thought, like, yeah, this is a language issue. We should get loads of linguists. Um, the, the Polish thought, no, maybe, maybe maths is what we need now. Um, so that was something that the British did copy, and I, I think that's really, really important that People breaking the Enigma were like Turing and, and people from hand, hand picked from, from Cambridge and Oxford University, and they were picked from the maths departments mainly. There were like um, <coughs> linguists, and, and, and there were random people as well. One of the things Bletchley Park did was um, they set like a, a crossword competition um, in the Times and said, if you can break this crossword in like 18 minutes, then send us your name and address. Little did those people know that um, they, they'd be. <laughs> they'd be, be uh, joining Bletchley Park, and, and most of them did. They, they went to Bletchley Park and did some more cross competitions and uh, got involved um, and, and remained there throughout the war. <coughs> the, way, the way the Enigma was broken was, I mean, a, a lot of the, the, the ideas, we use them now for, for code breaking. Um, known plain text was a, was a really good thing. Um, you can, you can if, you're, if you're sensible, with a war or, or any situation, you can force plain text. <coughs> and um, a good way to do that is killing people. So the, the British had this lovely idea that if they dropped bombs in certain places, bombed certain ships, <coughs> they knew the grid references. They, you know, they knew, the, knew the coordinates of where those ships were. And then in the radio traffic in the next you know, hour or so, that would be transmitted. So they've got some, something that they, they know what's in the message. Um, People are slack as well. Um, some of the German German military were a bit slack, really. They do things like um, use their girlfriend's initials as the uh, <coughs> the initial rotor settings, um, or they might transmit the weather forecast at a set time during the day in a set format. <coughs> the navy weren't slack at all. Breaking the the, the naval, naval enigma was the really difficult thing. Um, they, they just enforced the rules really rigidly. No girlfriends initials. Maybe the people in the German Navy didn't have girlfriends, I don't know. Um, but, but there was no like girlfriend initials or anything like that. There was no fixed weather forecasts. Um, so, so getting, getting a known plain text was quite difficult. The main way the enigma was broken was that <coughs> you've got these rotors, you've got this configuration, and you've got essentially pretty random text coming out what looks like pretty random text. Um, but within that text, it, it is really a fingerprint of how the machine is set up. And Turing worked out ways um, that we could like work out these fingerprints from, the, from these <coughs> configurations and, and like, have catalogs of, of, of fingerprints. And, and you know, fingerprinting is something that people use in computer security all the time in like um, TCPA stack fingerprinting, stuff like that. <coughs> The, the, the fingerprints like manifested themselves as these chains of letters. Um, 
where you're typing a message and maybe the letter E occurs quite a lot and it's encoded into various different things and as the, the wheels go around full rotations, <coughs> the, uh, you get like these patterns coming up that, that were, were termed chains. To find the chains, they used an idea that the Polish had come up with, the, these big machines called bombs, um, which I have, courtesy of Wikipedia, a lovely picture of a bomb here. Bombs are essentially a whole bunch of, of um, Enigma machines all stuck together um, and uh, cr crunching through. So you'd put in um, some uh, cipher text and the bomb, bomb would essentially try and decode it <coughs> in, in um, lot, so emulating lots of different configurations. Now, if you had sort of started with just the, these bombs and you had essentially done a brute force attack on the Enigma, no way, no way, you know, like with most um, cryptographic systems, it'd be like, take longer than the, the life of the universe, um, those kind of magnitudes of time to, to, to break it. So <clears throat> the key in breaking the Enigma was, was reducing the number of combinations, you know, discarding things um, <clears throat> by looking at these patterns, these patterns that um, negated certain configurations of the machine. You're like casting out these configurations as much as possible. <clears throat> I'll skip Bell Labs because it's about America and uh, we, we want to hear about Britain instead. Um, <laughs> the computer was not invented by Thomas Edison. Um, I, know, I know in America we think everything was Thomas Edison. <laughs> he, he, did, he didn't invent anything, come on. Um, mo most things in the world, bizarrely, were invented in Scotland. Um, if, if, if you look at the history inventions, like pretty much everything came from Scotland. Colour photography, light bulb, first power of flight was from Scotland. I, I don't particularly like Scotland, but you know it's a fact. It's a fact that I can't ignore. Um, <laughs> but certainly Edison didn't didn't invent shit. You know, um, Turing Turing was like working on a, on, on a plan for, for one of the first computers called the ACE. It's quite a cool acronym. Um, and he worked on the ACE, and he also went on to work on the Manchester Mark I. Um, these are two really influential, important um, computers um, in Britain that sort of dictated how computers would be designed and built and how memory and stuff would work. So worth looking into. <coughs> Turing um, was an open homosexual throughout his life, and uh, he was persecuted. Um, th this is a quote from the House of Lords. There are the hunchback, the blind, and the dumb. But of all the dreadful abnormalities, surely abnormal sexual instincts must be one of the worst. Um, homosexuals were really hated in England, um, just like lots of people are hated in England, and just like today, England's full of hate, like many countries in our, in our world. Um, Turing was arrested for homosexuality. He was actually arrested um, after reporting a break-in in his house. Um, probably a, a friend of one of his, or an associate of one of his lovers, um, broke into his house to uh, nick some trousers and, I don't know, the, the plans to the English machine or something. Um, and uh, Turing was charged with gross indecency. Um, and because England is such a lovely progressive country, he could have gone to prison, um, or, this is 1952, he could take what, what was essentially chemical castration. Um, now, in 1950s in, in the US, like, the 15 or 16 states had physical castration was like the punishment for being a homosexual. Um, but in, in progressive England, we had some chemicals to do it. Um, you essentially like take hormone, hormone treatment and be pumped full of like estrogen and have stuff to suppress testosterone and stuff like that. Um, a kind of consequence of this was, was, was Turing turned it into a woman. I mean, uh, sort of started turning into a woman. Um, women are great, but if you don't want to be one, it's not cool to like be forced to become one. Um, it's just not, not nice. So, something courtesy of Google image search. Um, there's a lot of controversy about Turing's death. Um, he died like a couple of years after the trial. Um, so sentenced to like 12 months of, of becoming a woman. Um, then a year later, he, uh, he um, possibly committed suicide found dead in his house. Um, official verdict was um, suicide by um, cyanide poisoning. <coughs> I'm, I'm not massively interested in, in whether he, he, he sort of jumped or was pushed. 
because I, I don't think it. E either way, you know, I, I feel he was murdered by by the state. Um, you know, whether he was like just persecuted as a homosexual and that drove him to kill himself, um, or whether he uh, he was actually assassinated. Um, for use a, a, a clinical term, a whole bunch of, of points about the death that are a bit strange. This apple that everyone assumed was poisoned was never tested or anything. Um, so, uh, do, you know, do, do look into the death, read about it on Wikipedia, read the Hodges book. And, uh, when, when you look at people like Turing, who were like obviously exceptionally intelligent and did, did a lot of really cool stuff, um, you have to ask, like, what can, what can you learn from them? And uh, in, in a lecture on Japanese garden design, I saw this really nice quote from uh, Matsuo Basho, who was a, a haiku writer. Do not seek to emulate the old masters. Seek what they sought. I think that when you look at the lives of people like Turing, you should, instead of just trying to, like, copy what they did, um, you know, instead of, like, running home and building an Enigma machine and, build, you know, building some physical Turing machines, seeing what happens, um, it's really nice to just try and think um, why he cared about this stuff, why he was interested, particularly in the mathematics. I know some people are a bit scared of mathematics, and, and there are good reasons for that. Um, but it's really nice to think about big, difficult ideas a lot. Um, it, it's, it's just really healthy for your brain to think about really random, difficult stuff. Um, so please do. <laughs> Um, I've been going to like hackathons for, for the past few years um, and, and seen hundreds of talks. Um, one kind of stood out um, head and shoulders above the rest. Um, so my talk's dedicated to, to um, a guy called Appleborn, who um, possibly is hiding in the audience right now. I can see him, in fact. So he's not dead or anything. It's not like dedicated to the memory of Jacob Appleborn. Um, <laughs> but but um, rumor has it that he may be speaking today um, in the afternoon on track C, although I didn't see him written up there. Um, this guy is an awesome speaker. He really, um, he really sort of sets the level of what HackerCon should be about, and uh, really, really powerful speaker. Please go and see him if he is talking today. Um, I'm not. I might take like. No, I'm not going to take any questions actually. If if you want to ask me questions, I'm here for like the next six days, but. It is, it's nice to have questions at the end of talks, but I really think if, if you're interested, come and find me at the con, you know, um, email me, um, post some comments on my blog. Um, unless, unless there's like, like one, maybe one, has anyone got a really burning question about Turing? That's all of you. No. Um, so, you know, come and, come and hunt me out. And um, if, if there's sufficient interest, then I'll sign up for a talk on track C probably on the last day, if people want me to go into a lot more detail about some, maybe the Ingram machine, the cryptography, or if you're interested in like artificial intelligence and that kind of thing, we could uh, maybe have more of a discussion. So if people come and are interested, um, come and find me and look out on the, uh, the listing for track C. Um, track C is like around the corner, and uh, I'll sign up. So um, that's it. Thank you ever so much for uh, an hour of your lives.